Okay, guys, let's let, let's get started. Uh, here, there's some handouts for you. So, so just so you understand, these are just this is just my notes, and you don't really even need to look at it. But sometimes, you know, when you hear a talk, and you're like, well, what did he say? You know, at this point, I want to I don't want I want to remember that, and that way you don't have to write it down. And um, you know, if you want to take a note, you can on the side of that. But okay, so. Um, let's, um, let's begin with a prayer. Please stand. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless this class for the parents today that we may be led through to your, the fullness of your truth, that we might understand our faith, love our faith, know our faith, and, um, and teach it to our children. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So, uh, so last time we, we went into that topic of transgender. I wanted to be able to give you a background on that. It's such a challenging topic for us. And today... We're going to make a shift because, you know, we'll get back to that book when it makes sense. Um, but right now I wanted to cover a topic. Uh, it kind of just came to me yesterday, actually. I was, I was planning on giving you guys a, a talk on, uh, on um, the development of the virtues, okay? And in fact, I, I was talking to Ryan before class started. He's, he's actually using this book, which is uh, on the virtues. That is, uh, let me see that, Ryan. This is, I have this book too. This is, this is written by the, uh, the Dominicans that are doing all of our material. You know, the, the religious sisters, um, the Domi uh, Re Dominican uh, sisters of Mary, mother of the Eucharist. But anyway, they're, doing the, they're, they're the ones that, that do, made the videos and also, all, actually all the videos for the older kids and the younger kids. But uh, I'm looking into the possibility of maybe having this as part of our curriculum next year. Okay, now, um, but I will get to that talk. I have a talk prepared already on the virtues. Um, but before I do that, I want to give today's talk, <clears throat> which is on prayer. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but if you were around last weekend, I, you know, when I was preaching, uh, we, we were talking about, remember the parable of the the. Ten virgins, the five wise virgins and the five um, foolish. Okay, and then we basically you you realize there's an analogy between uh, being wise as virgins, and they were basically had as they knew that their main task was to um, you know have their lamps and to greet the bridegroom when he came, to have a lamp lit. Right? We don't really under this is kind of a mysterious path. I mean, is this really is this what is this what young ladies did? We had to wait around for the bridegroom all, and then he would show up late in the night. We don't understand this. I don't understand this. Um, um, but it, our Lord has this story to show us that it, they were so clear that this was their main thing they needed to do, and they knew it. The other ones weren't wise though. They they were so, he doesn't go into any details. Jesus doesn't go into any details, but they clearly they weren't prepared. That's the main thing you get out of the story, right? So I told you last weekend that how are you, you, what does this have to do with us? Well, the very most important that we must thing that we must do is to go to heaven. And it takes being prepared. And so what would be the sort of analogy to having our lamps lit and having our oil and our flask full? Well, I made a little list last weekend, okay? And so what, what's that list? It's right there on your page. Um, striving to hear and understand all 
of God's word and to respond to it with faith. Okay, I, I would call that, that's like the fundamental thing that every human being must do. If you never do that, you missed out on life. We all have to hear God's word and respond to it with faith. And I say all of his word. Okay? Um, and then the next thing, believing and following all of the teachings of the Catholic Church. Okay? Um, on faith and morals. And then the next thing, accepting and attempting to fulfill all of the five precepts. Was that a new term for you guys? The five precepts of the church? Yes. Yeah. And then you guys, you look like you're reading. I shouldn't have given you this page. Why don't you just put that aside and let's just, just look at me. Joey's been reading this whole time. He wants to get through this. He's going to leave halfway through it and say, I've already read it, Father. Yeah, I went to Chico for church last, last weekend. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I'm going through it. I'm going it's like, through it. It's like those notes they sold in class. I'm still notes like in this class. Just put it down. I, I, I kind of regret I gave you guys that. Okay, so did you hear my question? I asked you, do you, have you heard of the precepts before, or is this new? I mean, just be honest. Yeah, got a couple of people said no. I think you brought up the four previous. Online. Really? I thought so. Uh -huh. No, Joey, yes, no. I've heard of precepts, but I'm not. I yeah, you didn't know, know what they are. Um, right, yeah. okay. See, so that's all I'm asking. For the most part, people don't know what those are. This is, this is like a preamble to us getting into prayer. But I want you to understand, like, where, what, you know, prayer is a part of a list. Right now, again, what am I doing? I'm making a list of things that people say, oh, you know what? I want to go to heaven. What do I need to do? And this is the list of stuff that good Catholics do, right? You know, and they hear the word of God. They listen to all the teachings of the church. And what do they do? They, uh, they follow the five precepts. The church narrowed it down to five things that they're saying, these are a must. These are a must. And what are they? Well, number one, you shall attend mass on Sundays and holy days of obligation and rest from servile labor on Sundays, right? That's basically following the third commandment, all right? They're saying that's top priority. Number two, the second precept, you shall confess your sins at least once a year. Some people forgot that, I don't know. In fact, my own mom forgot that. When I, 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 my sister was saying, I gotta get my kids in there before the end of the year and I gotta get them confessed. And my mom was like, oh no, no you don't. You just have to confess if you have a mortal sin. And I said, but mom, there is a precept of the church that says you must go once a year. But she's like, ah. Anyway, sorry mom, she's, she's passed away. <laughs> but that's, see, that's the way a lot of us are. This, see, but no, the church is our mother. It's trying to take care of us. We, it, this, is a, this is a requirement, this is, you know, fundamental. You want to have your flask full of oil and ready to go when the Lord calls you? You got to do this, okay? Next thing, um, you shall receive the sacrament of the Eucharist at least during the Easter season. They used to call this what? Anybody know? The Easter duty. This is an old term for people because they don't even, no one really seems to, actually for most Catholics, they just think everyone goes to communion every time. This is an old thought because there are people that realize, no, I can't go to communion because I'm not following, I'm in mortal sin, essentially. They realize that, but they didn't want to change. So they would push off going to confession and the church is saying, well, fine, put it off because we don't want you going to uh, communion when you're not actually in communion with the church but you can't put it off forever. We have to keep you in line and say, no more than one year, and you gotta do it during Easter. You get it? Okay. Uh, the fourth precept, you shall observe the days of fasting and abstinence established by the church. Number five, you shall help provide for the needs of the church. How? With your, what, TTT? Awesome. Time. Talent. Talent. Treasure. You, you had it there on your first one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's how you provide for the needs of the church. Okay. There's your five precepts. Catholics who don't uh, pay attention to the five precepts, they're, dang they're living dangerously. Okay. Number, the next thing. Develop a prayer life that is integral to your life. All right. Um, not just an afterthought. In other words, what I mean by afterthought is we tend to think of prayer only when things uh, get kind of uh, sketchy for us. When we have a lot of pressure, oh, I better go pray. We have something bad happen, I better go pray. But it needs to be part of your plan to say, oh, no, I need a prayer life. 
Okay, and that's what, I mean, so this is, the, this is how this fits into our scheme as, as Catholics, prayer life. It's one of the main things. The next thing, spiritual reading. So, um, you know, it, it makes sense to me that Catholics, you know, if you can read, I guess some people are not very good at reading and they don't read. Okay, well then watch some YouTube videos, I guess. But delve into the, you know, the, the, you know, the understanding of our faith through your own investigation. That's what, you should be doing that on a regular basis. Okay, you want to be prepared at the end of your life for, for, you know, for your judgment? Do that. That's, it. That's another thing. Okay, what else? Regular penance. And um, at least following the church's requirements. Anybody know what the church's requirements are on that? All right. What's the year? Penance? Yeah. Uh, well, there's the Fridays of Lent. Yes. Good Friday. Yes. Ash Wednesday. Okay, yeah, we're getting a little off. Your name and like when we do uh, uh, fasting and abstinence. Oh, right, right, right. Penance uh, by the canon law. You're required to do a penance every Friday of the year. Okay, you want to go to heaven? Do a penance every Friday. This is what it's saying. This is one of the, you know. And uh, by the way, when I say that, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying God's going to go, that guy didn't do his penance on Friday and he's not coming into heaven. But th this is like looking at it from the other side. Do you want to go to heaven? Well, these are the things that, you know, good Catholics do, right? This is what puts you, gets your lamp lit. But a penance, did you guys realize that we used to, um, uh, the church required that you couldn't eat meat on Fridays every Friday, right? When did they take that away? Anybody know? Mid-century. Mid 60s, in the 60s, okay? But here's the thing. This is the part that most people don't know. When the, when, it was really just the United States that did this. It was our conference. So all the rest of the world just basically follows canon law, which says you've got to do a penance every Friday and every day of Lent. Okay, so Lent, Lent's like 46 days or something. Every day of Lent and every Friday, unless it's a solemnity. If it's a solemnity, that's a big feast. We don't do penance, like at least not the mortification style, right? Not while it's a big feast, a day of celebration. So, but all the other days, the Fridays, yes. Now, in the 60s, what the church said before that, beforehand, I don't know when it started, but they basically said, let's give the people, let's give these sheep, let's guide them to where they need to go, okay? And what did they do? They said, don't eat meat every Friday. Now, somebody might have said, oh, well, can I do more penance? Of course you can. But they just were making sure people were doing a penance every Friday. But... When they decided, what we're going to do is we're going to lift that, but they told you, um, no longer do you have to not eat meat on Friday. We'll do that during the Fridays of Lent. But now you need to choose your own penance for every Friday. But it's that second part there, most people don't know it. And I'm just letting you know. Okay? This is part of... Um, see, a lot of people have lost this concept of penance. Penance is a healthy way of living, all right? And we can talk about that some other day, but okay? So, so now, let's talk about prayer. And stop reading that thing. Turn it over. <laughs> I just feel like I can't get, I can't, I, I, I can't get your attention. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to, you know, I wrote it down so that I'd be prepared. You know, and I figure, why not give it to him? No, it's helping with my... Uh, it's actually learning. super useful, because I... Yeah, I, 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 I... Yeah, it's a call of All right, just don't read it. Give me some eye contact. And if you need to take a note, find where we're at. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so I, I just want to say, look, prayer is so important, you guys. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Too much eye contact, anyway. No, I love it. Okay. I love it. I love, <laughs> don't worry about that. Just keep looking at me. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you guys, so you, don't, you don't know, <laughs> Joey, you, you don't know. You're a doctor. You, you know, your people are sitting there. They're worried about whether or not uh, they're going to die or whatever. And, and you're like, I got some important information. But they're all ears. And they got their <laughs> eyes right on you, right? But you don't know what it's like to give talks at church every week. And, and at church, people they sort of decide for themselves on whether or not they're really going to listen. I don't you know if you've noticed that. And they just, they're just kind of like, mm -hmm. it, it's a little bit annoying. 
But here's the thing. I know you could be listening, and then I just don't know. In other words, some people close their eyes and everything. I sometimes look away, but I'm not actually looking at what I'm looking at. I'm hearing the words. Sure. But I would just say, if you want to do me a favor and anybody else that speaks, keep looking at them. You know, I mean, okay, fine. You want to look away. You don't want to have this lock, laser eye lock or whatever. But just keep, left or yeah. Right eye. Yeah, I'm disciplining you. Okay. Okay. So, so I okay. I want to explain. Um, I didn't realize how important prayer is until I grew up and was plenty old. I mean, you know. I mean, here's the thing. I went to Catholic school. I come from a family with nine children, and um, you know, what did we do in our house? Like, so first of all, just so you understand the background. They sent us to Catholic school, my parents, and we went to church every week. And we realized you have to go every week, you know? Um, so th th there was definitely, you know, a good background, right? But it kind of stopped there. And I mean, I, again, I'm not complaining. I'm just trying to explain to you that, um, like, what would we do at home? Well, we would say grace occasionally together. We didn't say it all the time, we'd just eat. Okay, occasionally, maybe on Thanksgiving, Christmas or something. But here's the thing, I could kind of tell in my dad, he was a little embarrassed, especially when we got a little older. Like all of a sudden, he's the one talking and about God. And God seems to be some sort of a like, kind of a feminine thing, if you know what I mean. Because you're sort of expressing, um, you know, these things that are not as, you know, they're not, they're not easily, you know, they're not concrete. They're more... Uh, they're about a lot, a lot more about feelings and things, okay? Obviously, we could go all into that, if, but I don't want to spend time on that. I just want you to understand, though, I could kind of see it in my dad that he just, he never got the comfort. But the thing is, how do you get the comfort of leading people in prayer? You have to, you have to force you, and you have to have somebody teach you that it's important, you know? I mean, uh, in other words, um, glory to Jesus, I found out about prayer. But I don't think all my family did. I don't think the rest of them did. I mean, a lot of them. Um, so um, I'm just trying to tell you, if you're a little uncomfortable about leading other people in prayer, you know, especially the men, um, do your best to get over it, okay? Because this is super important. I mean, the kids really are influenced by, especially their father, with regard to prayer, all right? Uh, I remember, yeah, I was saying, I remember that my dad one time, he was talking about the rosary, I think. He said he would rather, like he somehow, I don't know, he was uncomfortable with the rosary. But he said, he somehow said like, um, I would rather dig a ditch than pray the rosary. Like he just, he wanted to do something. And he was trying to show that like digging a ditch is hard. And he was like, that was easier on me than on my mind with the, and I'm like, <laughs> whatever. My mom didn't like the rosary either. Neither one of them. Um, but they didn't have YouTube, so they could just listen in. Yeah, <laughs> right. Write um, it, read it. <laughs> okay, so. So prayer is super important. In fact, I want to give you this little thing that I kind of thought of this morning. God is trying to get, you guys realize, you know, getting it and going to heaven, getting it in life, you know, hearing God's word and responding with faith and doing what you got to do and then going to heaven. This is not like a binary thing, like on, off. Like it is in the sense that some people will make it and some won't. But there's making it, and then there's making it. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, like, you want to live a really good life. And what so many of us don't really understand is, is that your relationship with God has everything to do with that. You want to live a really good life, don't you? Yeah, and you're like, of course I want to go to heaven. But even beyond that, like, I want to, I want, I, I like, I want to, at the end of my life, be super, you know, satisfied and, and not regretting what I did with my life. And um, it's through your prayer life that you're going to get there. And so I want you to imagine that, like, God has these, like, just, this is kind of a crazy idea, but, like, to imagine there's a little tube where, like, his will, you know, his desires for you and his knowledge and his um, 
influence on you comes through this tube. And it kind of, and it's kind of like kind of flows back and forth, right? Because you're you're sort of communicating with him, and he's communicating with you, right? Well, you have this little tiny tube, all right. But when you improve your prayer life, the tube starts to get bigger. Okay, so like it's kind of weird because you can't I mean, like with pipes. Does that ever happen? That like we build up a pipe system, and then over time the pipe gets wider. It usually, gets more narrow, doesn't it? corroded or whatever. But what I'm trying to say is that this pipe between you and God, it gets bigger when you actually practice it. I, I'm, I bet you there are people at the end of their lives, they're going to see their tube and it's the same tube the whole life. And it's a little teeny, teeny, tiny tube. They're barely ever hearing God. Do you see what I mean? Of course you hear him when you go to church. Of course you hear him if you read the Bible. And that's part of the tube, right? But your personal prayer with God. This, God wants to have this sort of interchange with you on a regular basis. And he gave us a good example, being a human being himself, of that he prayed on a regular basis. Okay, so let's start with what is prayer? And by the way, let's see. So we're going, started at one, we're going to go to 2.15. Um, so, and I want to leave, because the most, the, 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 the best part of this talk is going to be at the end, where we're going to look at Catherine of Siena on the treatise of prayer. So we will, I will not let myself go past, what, um, quarter till and not start that, because that might take a half an hour to go over that, okay? I just want to make sure I, I get to that. So before that, right? So, by the way, I mean, let's keep in mind, too. I'm trying to express to you guys my feeble understanding of prayer. Prayer is a mountain, okay? And like, you, you can't really teach people stuff that you don't have yourself. And so I'm doing my best because I only have so much of this, right? I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, um, you know, God has brought to, uh, into my life a number of um, mystics. You know what a mystic is? Somebody who has visions of the future. Okay, it might be about the future, but yeah. Somebody has visions, yeah. Um, More divine connection. Well, it's where, it's beyond, like, so like if you and I, you know, you go home tonight and you pray and I pray and we say, well, yeah, I prayed and this is my feeling afterward, right? We don't call that mysticism. Mysticism is where somebody actually hears without a doubt this extra voice. I, I used to, this friend of mine, um, she was from Yuba City. She, uh, I, she was one of my parishioners. Um, I, I would ask her, well, how do you even know? Because she would tell me word for word what God said. And I'm like, well, how'd you know that? And she's like, well, it's like another voice. I'm like, so she, because she's basically saying that. I'm, I said, but, yeah, but we all have a voice in our head. And she's like, no, no, it's a second, it's a, it's a different one. Like she has her voice and then there's this other voice. She could like clearly distinguish it. Now, God doesn't give this to everybody. You know what I mean? He doesn't give this to everybody. It's for certain people to have this gift, and then they use it for him. Okay, and she used it for, God's, for, for me, to help me, okay, as a priest. But, uh, I mean, she had visions of things, too. But here's the thing. One time I was with her, and I thought, well, I'm going to ask her, how do you pray? She, she's got a connection, a good connection with God. I was like, I want to see what she says. And she says, it's easy. She says, you just, um, you just tell God how you feel. And I was like, wow. Now, here's the thing. That better not be your whole prayer. Okay. Like, Lord, I feel really cool today. Talk to you later. Yeah. You know, or I'm, I'm mad or whatever. But no, no, no. I mean, here's the thing. It takes faith to actually tell God how you feel. Why? First of all, you're talking to somebody that doesn't, you know, you don't audibly hear him back. So to believe that he's actually hearing you, it takes faith. Prayer takes faith, okay? And you're constantly tested. You know, I'm getting kind of hot. I'm going to take this sweater off. Yeah, thanks.
Okay, so, so doesn't it take faith? I mean, prayer takes faith, okay? Um, if you have very little faith, prayer is going to be difficult. Now, but keep in mind, prayer is difficult for everyone. So let's not like try to say that, oh, it's, you know, it's just, you just have to have faith and then it's going to be easy. I'm not trying to say that. Um, as a matter of fact, the catechism has a paragraph there. Um, it's uh, number 2725. Let's read that paragraph. Um, go ahead. You can look at it, Joey. <laughs> 2725. That's on page two. Um, prayer is both a gift of grace and a determined response on our part, part. It always presupposes effort. The great figures of prayer of the old covenant before Christ, as well as the mother of God, the saints, and he himself, all teach us this, prayer is a battle. By the way, before I even go any further, why would it be, who's against us? Stop, look up to me, you're reading ahead. No. Just look up. Our sins are the devil. There you go. That's right. The devil. He's, he does not want you to pray well. He's your main enemy. Obviously, you know, there's other things that, you know, just plain distractions, which would be part of, uh, it could be the devil, but it also could just be part of your humanity. In other words, your flesh. Okay? Uh, because again, we're trying to do something spiritual, and our flesh doesn't always want to cooperate with the spirit. Okay, so... And then it says, so against, against whom? Against ourselves and against the wiles of the tempter, the devil, who, do, who does all he can to turn man away from prayer, away from union with God. We pray as we live, because we live as we pray. If we do not want to act habitually according to the spirit of Christ, neither can we pray habitually in his name. Okay? So it's making this connection between Actually, it sounds like the virtues. Act habitually in accord with the Spirit of Christ. Okay? Is it, is it kind of hot in here? Or that's just me. It's hot. You said that. I can do it if you can. I'm quite comfortable after that. I'm usually the, I'm usually the, the first one to be cold. So I, sh I shouldn't be hot right now, but... Okay, we pray as we live. Okay, if we do not want to act habitually according to the Spirit of Christ, neither can we pray habitually in His name. The spiritual battle of Christian new life is inseparable from the battle of prayer. Okay, what does that mean, new life? Christian new life. What's that? Uh, yeah, it's our baptism which gives us a new life because we are a new creation in Christ, right? Capital Through the resurrection, L. what? Capital L. Life. Capital L. Life saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the life of God, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Okay, but so, so it's a new life in Christ, right? That's, a, that's kind of a fundamental of Christianity. Okay. So, uh, going back up, let's read uh, the first paragraph there, 2558. Great is the mystery of the faith. The mystery then requires that the faithful believe in it, that they celebrate it, and that they live from it in a vital and personal relationship with the living and true God. This relationship is prayer. For me, prayer is a surge of the heart. It is a simple look turned toward heaven. It is a cry of recognition uh, and of love, embracing both trial and joy. Okay, that was St. Therese of Lisieux. Okay, so you have to admit, it's kind of a mysterious thing, prayer. Here's these paragraphs are from the catechism are trying to explain it. And we'll get, we're going to get more into the practicalities of you know, how, what, you know, how to do prayer and, and what types of prayer there are in a little bit. But right now, we're just trying to, like, we're looking at uh, prayer just trying to, like, theologically, trying to understand, well, what is this? What, you know, what's prayer about? And, okay? So, prayer as a gift of God, as God's gift. Prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God, or the requesting of good things from God. But when we pray, 
Do we speak from the height of our pride and will or out of the depths of a humble and contrite heart? He who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility is the foundation of prayer. Only when we humbly acknowledge that we do not know how to pray as we ought are we ready to receive freely the gift of prayer. Man is a beggar before God. Okay, so you can imagine. Um, you, you, if you want to have a good prayer life, you've got to ask God for it. This is not like something that like just super smart people are going to do. Oh yeah, I'm going to read some books on prayer and then all of a sudden you're like, and let me do it a couple of times. Now that wouldn't hurt you to read some books on prayer and it wouldn't hurt you to you know, do it a couple of times. But this is not the same as you know, uh, shooting a bow and arrow. You know, I mean, um, you, um, you know, you, uh, you're really dependent on God. You've got to ask God to help you with this, this big task. And it's a super important task. When, um, you, when I pray for help with my mercies, especially patience, because I didn't know I was lacking <laughs> until I did, I find that I'm not being helped with my virtue, but I'm giving many opportunities to work on this. <laughs> yeah. So you got to work on this. There you go. And, and if you're praying, you're not hurting your kids. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here's here's the thing, Erica. I would say prayer is integral to the development of virtue. Um, uh, it, 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 and so is penance. Those three things. So penance. Prayer, virtue. They, go to get, they all go together, right? And in some mysterious way. Like there's not like an exact formula, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say this. With mortification, you're telling yourself, your body, no. So you got your, you got your soul, you got your will, right? And your reason. And it's guiding everything, but your body's attracted to stuff, right? To pizza and whatever, right? Honor before men. You know, I, I love to be honored, you know? All these things, right? Um, but your mind, and because you're informed by faith, is guiding you toward what's good. And there's always sort of this challenge of getting yourself to follow what your heart is leading you toward with your will. And so... The penance with the mortification is the telling of your self or your body, no. Even though, like, it seems like, you know, like you're inclined to do it, right? Okay? So it's telling yourself no, you know? And so that leads into virtue because that's really what the virtues are. The virtues are being able to tell yourself no when you need to. If you want to be patient, if you want to be kind, if you want to be gentle, if you want to be uh, ch chaste, chastity, uh, all these things, you know, it's more or less, it's restraining yourself, and then that way your love and the goodness comes through, okay, to do what's right. All right, uh, now, if you knew the gift of God, the wonder of prayer is revealed beside, beside the well where we come seeking water. There, Christ comes to meet every human being. He, it is he who first seeks us and asks us for a drink. Jesus thirsts. His asking arises from the depths of God's desire for us. Whether we realize it or not, prayer is the encounter of God's thirst with ours. God thirsts that we may thirst for him. Okay, so... You know, Jesus makes this analogy of water. I'm the living water. Remember the woman at the well? He told her, I can give you water to where you don't even have to come drink anymore. And he says, and this water will well up inside of you. What is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the life of Christ in you. But prayer is this sort of thing that allows this to happen. You, it, there, you know, it has to do with us coming to know God's will and loving it, which is loving God, okay? And then everything can flow out of loving God. And this is something that mysteriously happens through our speaking to God, okay? 
And by the way, there's other prayer too. We don't just speak to God. People sometimes think like Catholics are um, that we're idolaters because we speak to other people that are in the other world that are not God. That's not wrong to speak to other people. In other words, you believe they're there. You know the saints are there. You might be wasting your time if you're just talking to people that died and you don't know if they're in heaven. But for sure, if you talk to a saint, they're there. And God does not prohibit us from talking to them. He likes us to talk to them. And then they talk to God for us, and it creates this whole relationship. So prayer is not just talking directly to God. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Let's move, let's move on. So, um, so they got all these, you know, these, there's a lot. I've cut, this was not just uh, printing every paragraph they have. There's a, there's a whole section of the catechism. I'm trying to cover prayer all today in this little hour and 15. Do you guys realize that there's only four sections in that big, thick catechism? One of the whole sections is prayer. Okay, so I, I'm not going to try to cover it all today. But you, you can see there, there's a bunch of things that are describing what prayer is about. So now, what have we been doing? We've been talking more like theoretically, what is prayer? Okay, but now let's talk about how do I pray? Let's get practical. As I say, let's get out of the clouds. Okay? So, look at that. I already I told that story about um, the mystic. I jumped ahead. Um, she says, it's simple. Just talk to God. And you know what? That's a, great, uh, that's a great piece of advice. And before I even get into the rest of this talk, let me just tell you some basic things that I almost always tell people when like, I'll hear people in, in confession and I'll try to help them with prayer. Um, uh, number one, you need to talk to God every day, uh, like personally, okay, which is what we already said. Just tell him how you feel. Talk to God personally, right? Now, here's the thing. That's probably the most challenging part of prayer there is, because let me just tell you, just praying written prayers, is it good? Yes. And we're going to get into that in a minute. But... There's, uh, it's more of a challenge to just sit before God and, and try to discern what it is that he's telling you, okay? And to talk to him in a meaningful way. You have to admit, it takes more, a little more, it's a little bit more of a challenge, okay? So, um, and here's the thing. I think... We'll get into this form. There's a form of prayer called um, Lexio Divina. Have you ever heard of that before? Lexio Divina? All right. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. But it's essentially encountering God through the scriptures. Okay? Through the scriptures. Yeah, it's, it's echoey in here a little bit, so it's kind of hard to have. Yeah, I wish there was... Uh, anyway. Um, okay. So... Um, so um, we, my advice to people often is like for people that don't, like, okay, a lot of us, especially if you have kids, you pray with your kids before you go to bed. And then what, what does that involve? Well, that involves, you know, our Father, Hail Mary, you know, a few little, you know, quick prayers, right? And that's good. But I think I joked about this the other day. I actually got this from this other priest named Father Blount, but he's like, that's good for a three-year-old. <laughs> but we're not three. So there's nothing wrong with those, that little, you know, you know, you, you should start there with your kids. You should start there. Let's pray some prayers that we can memorize, okay? And let's maybe even, like, you could just do a little bit of ad lib and say, Lord, uh, we want to thank you for this at the end of the day, right? And we want to ask for this, Okay. But for you personally, my advice, make sure that you at least take five minutes a day to talk to God. Okay? At least five. But here's the thing. My advice to you is make sure it's consistent. It's got to happen every day. If you don't do it every day, I think it kind of falls apart. Okay? So five minutes every day. And then what could you do with that five minutes? Well... I mean, we're going to talk about how you can expand your prayer life in lots of different directions, okay? But what can you do with that five minutes just to start with? If some of you, this will just be a start. 
Well, why don't you read the Bible, like some lines of scripture, and then read it twice, and then just sit there silently. Let's see if any thoughts come to your mind. Okay? And then talk to God about those thoughts. Now, okay, this is actually one of the, one of the areas. This is, this is meditation. Um, and in fact, so I'm kind of jumping ahead. Okay, before I jump ahead though, you know, the church shows us that there's various forms, all right? And what are they? There's prayer of blessing or adoration, prayer of petition, prayer of intercession, prayer of thanksgiving, prayer of praise, okay? Now, um, let's also say too, part of your prayer is just going to church. Do you pray when you're at church? Yeah, okay. How? Well, let's, let's make sure we understand too. When you get to church, what's the first thing you should do? Yeah. Genuflect, that's right. You genuflect, not here though, because we don't have a tabernacle, okay? But you genuflect, and then you, you kneel down, and then what do you do? Let's, 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 let's cover that. What do, you, what do you think you do? Yeah, to, to participate in this holy thing that I'm going to be part of. So you acknowledge that, that something special is about to happen. Yeah, okay, but so like, so but what would that involve though? No, but I mean, what should, what should go through your mind in that moment while you're kneeling down? I could talk on a lot of Push, push him away. You say, okay, Lord, I want to like be focused. Okay, but, okay but, so one, but, but, but so one thing we haven't said yet, though, that's super, super important. You start with uh, asking the Lord forgiveness for your sins. Okay? Now, if you have a mortal sin, my advice is go to confession first so that you can go to communion. Otherwise, you won't be able to go to communion. Okay? But the Mass itself, will, you'll be forgiven at the Mass for your venial sins, but you need to start with a good act of repentance. So you have to examine your conscience. So my advice is when mass starts, before it starts, this is why, I don't know if you've noticed, but the choir in um, uh, Quincy, I've asked them to please, because they come real early and they prepare themselves, I asked them to please stop at 10 minutes till. Today, actually, they went a little bit long, but, that's, but why? So that we would have 10 minutes of silence, so that you come in and you kneel down, nothing distracting you, and you tell the Lord, you examine your conscience, okay? Because this is, if you really want to talk to God, that's the, like, that's the best way to set the stage, isn't it? Like imagine if you have a, a good friend and there's something between you and you want to have a good talk with them and a good, a good interaction with them. How, what a better way to start it. You, it there's, no way, there's, no, there's no way to replace that. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so you start by examining your conscience and asking God for forgiveness. And then when we get to the beginning of the Mass where we do that part where we say, um, I confess to Almighty God, you know, this, this is the uh, penitential rite of the church. There's, we don't spend, like, I actually try to extend it a little bit. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I try to make it a little bit longer than, in other words, I say, let us prepare ourselves now by, you know, I can't even think of the words right now, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, and then there's a little, a little moment of silence. You'll notice that some churches, there's no silence. They just move right into it. Yeah, no, I want to actually give you a chance to try to recall your sins. But I will say this, you've got to prepare for it. You can't just like in that moment, because I have to admit in that moment, well, I'm the one leading you guys, so it's a little bit harder. It feels like there's more pressure on me to, you know, sort of roll or whatever, but but it's hard to think of it in that moment because you know it's only a short window, right? So my advice to you is prepare yourself before Mass starts by, by asking for forgiveness for all those sins. And by the way, the other thing is too, I've, I've mentioned this before. If I were you guys, I would keep a list. That's the best thing. Just write down your name. Whenever you think of a sin that you know you committed, like I shouldn't have said that that way. I had a bad attitude. I shouldn't have done it this way. I should have blah, 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 blah. Write it down. And then when you go to confession, you're able to actually tell all those concrete things that you did wrong, rather than just what I tend to see is an analysis. Okay? Do you see what I mean? Like, in other words, people come to confession and they, they're like, well, I'm pretty much like this and I'm pretty much like that. There's no real concreteness like, I did this. 
Remember how the church taught us a long time ago? It said, you should tell your sins number and kind. In other words, you actually say, I did this three times. That's the, the old church told us that. You don't hear it that much anymore, but it's actually the best way. Why? Because you're being very concrete about it. This is the only way for you to improve yourself. You be very honest with God and be very concrete. Yeah, Joey. In the confessional, do you want to hear like, the example, the like, exact details of how it went down? Like, If I was angry with my kids, like, this is a scenario, or you just say anger. Well, here's the thing. Now, here's the thing. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, I don't want you to have to like get into the weeds of things that are that it's not that important as long as you're being very clear about what the sin was. In other words, sometimes I've even heard people say they've generalized it so much that they're like, what did they say? They said, uh, I did what I wasn't supposed to do. <laughs> it's like, you're not going to be any more specific than that? that? That's not confession. I did what I wasn't supposed to do. Um, you know, I'm like, well, what did you do? Um, but to actually go a play-by-play -play is not necessary, especially like sexual things. Now, it wouldn't hurt that you honestly admit what it is. You know, like if it's a sexual sin, you go, yeah, I lusted, or I did this, I, you know, okay? Because um, that way, you know, you're owning it. Because there's a lot of times we don't really own these things, and we just give this, these really faint, like, inferences. Okay, I don't, I, I don't suggest that. But, and, and which I also say, be concrete but not in all the weeds about all the details. You don't, that's not necessary, but it's, it's necessary for you to explain your real fault. That's all you're doing. I mean, think about this, you guys. Um, think about this. Have you ever had somebody do something against you and they, they act like they're not even really sure that they did anything against you, but they just wanna tell you they're sorry so that you won't be mad at them? So they kind of say, well, if I hurt you, well, then I'm sorry. You're like, well, I guess you're not too sure whether or not you hurt me. But see, that's not, the, that's not really the type of thing that sort of brings about a, a feeling of wanting to forgive someone. You know what I mean? Like what brings it about is if the person says, I clearly did this wrong against you. And if, and if I were you, I'd be hurt. And I feel terrible about that. Do you see what I mean, how different that sounds? Then if I did this against you, well, then I'm sorry. And you're like not even, sh you know what I mean? It's just, it doesn't work. So be that way with God is my advice to you. In fact, don't be afraid that you overdid it a little bit. But certainly don't underdo it. I, and I don't want you to be morbidly, you know, like scrupulous at all. Don't be scrupulous. Trust that if you've, if you've confessed something before, God has forgiven you. Okay? But... What I mean by the analysis is that sometimes people, they don't go to confession very often at all, like once every year or more. And then they're just like, well, I'm kind of like this and I'm kind of like that. And there's nothing really concrete about it. And I'm just saying, if you want to improve your life, be very concrete. You say, yeah, I did this. It was wrong. And I did this. I lacked this virtue. See, because then you owned it. You're very, you know, and Christ is is forgiving you clearly for that, and then you move forward, and your whole psyche, everything is healed. Okay, it's about healing, and it does. There are there's better ways to do it than others. Okay, so you understand that. All right. Um, so you know, there's all these different areas of prayer. Uh, one of the things I was. I, I wanted you to realize is that prayer is not just personal. We, you know, when you go to church, you're praying at church, right? Now, uh, it says here, a prayer of blessing and adoration. What are you doing during the Gloria? Have you thought about that? What's going through your mind during the Gloria? You know, I the, the, yeah, like, I mean, here's the thing. I try to, and I'm not always good at this, but I try to remember to, I don't, I don't look around during the, this isn't time, most people are looking around. This is not time to look around. Look at Jesus. Look, imagine him in all of his kingly attire with a crown, and, you know, you know he's in heaven, and he's glorious for everything that he did for us, Okay? 
That's adoration. That's praising him, thanking him for being so good to us. You know what I mean? That's the time to do that, is the Gloria. Okay? But, um, you know, other times to do that would be when you go to holy adoration. You go and you sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and you're like, Lord, I know a lot of people don't believe that this is actually your body and blood. I believe. That's why I wanted to come down here on a separate occasion and actually kneel in front of you and, and chant the, the beautiful prayers and everything, you know, when Father's doing the incense and everything. Why? Because you're up there on that altar, and that's you. And I believe it, even though most of the world doubts this. Okay? So that's just another... And, but but, but his, his glorious presence. Okay? So that's another way of glory and adoration. Okay? Um, prayer of petition. So they give us a couple of... Um, paragraphs, but what I want to say about petition is this. One time I, I met this, uh, this guy was telling me about his father who died when he, we were going to do, oh, look, it's time. We got to get to that last page. Um, so, but I'll finish with this. So, um, this guy um, was telling me about his father who died. We were preparing for his funeral. And he told me about how his father prayed for everybody. In fact, like he would meet somebody, and just a stranger, and then next thing you know, he's like asking him about this, his life or whatever, and he's like, he was like, well, I'm going to pray about that. And he would. And in fact, I can't remember if this was the example or not, but all I know is it turned into something for me. I try to do this, but I'm not, I'm not always great at it. But this is what I do. I keep a list. I have a list of petitions where if somebody says to me specifically, can you pray for this for me? I write it down. And I have, it takes me about like 10 or 15 minutes to go through the list, just to read it. So I kneel down and I read the list. It's got everything that I, that I can remember that people asked me to pray for. But I was so impressed with that guy that he told me about, because I was like, that is like, this is a, I mean, that's a true, you know, person like Christ, you know, somebody that actually not just says, oh, I'll pray for you, and, yeah, I'll pray, but that actually like writes it down and it's like, I want to pray about it, and I'm going to continue to pray about it. You see what I mean? So, and you pray with faith that it really is making a difference. Sometimes these petitions that we pray for, you know, we should be praying for the most important things, by the way, too. We should be praying for the uh, conversion of many people in our lives, all right, that they might be saved. Okay, um, so, um, but we we pray this list and pray it with faith that you know. But I was going to say sometimes things don't happen for years, 20, 30 years. Oh, is that right? So they were praying for you guys to get confirmation. And then it happened. Yeah, and they told us when we got confirmed. That's great. That's great. That's great. They never said anything about it. They never said you should be confirmed. Yeah. Well, they do need to do the um, the D and the E of the PDE. You know what that means? Prayer, doctrine, and an example of a holy and honorable life. But that's great that they did it, and it happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just it's kind of kidding, but I mean it's true. We have to include the other part too. The doctrine, in other words, they sh people should say, you know, hey, you should get confirmed. Yeah. All right. Um, now, I want to go into, I want to read through this part that this is a treatise on prayer, okay, that is Catherine of Siena. Um, so, by the way, we'll get back to that other stuff if there's time, but if you see, we kind of jumped ahead. We got what is meditation, and then this is stuff that came from uh, the the uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops website, and they were answering these questions. What is meditation? Um, and, um, and then how do we pray with sacred scripture? Well, that's the Lexio Divina, and it's got these four stages, okay? So you can read that on your own if I don't get back to it. But I want to go, back, I want to go over to the Treatise of Prayer. Okay, we're gonna, I'm going to read through this, and it's got gold in it, so we're going to grab the gold as we go, Okay. This is, by the way, this is God the Father speaking to Catherine of Siena. You realize this is 1370, and God the Father 
um, spoke to Catherine like she would be in an ecstasy. You know what that means, to be in an ecstasy? She would be like, like almost like unconscious. And she would go to church during Holy Mass, and she would, um, I think she would actually, she'd end up laying down, and she'd be, just be like unconscious, because she'd be lifted to the heights of her union with God during the Holy Mass. And in fact, sometimes people would, you know how we mistreat saints, and they mistreated her, and so there would be people that thought she was faking it, and so like the, the, the people that worked there at the church even, they would take her and drag her out, sometimes out the front door, and just leave her there in front of the church in her state of ecstasy and close the doors. And people would come by. She even would got bruised up because people, other people, they, they, they kind of scoffed at her and thought she was faking it. And uh, they would like kick her. And she, <laughs> she ended up getting bruised. Um, but, but anyway, yeah, no, this, she's, she's in this like heavenly state. She's like, like out of this world. And God, God would, uh, he would dictate all these amazing things. And then she had scribes writing it down while she was in an ecstasy. Okay? So, when the soul has passed through the doctrine of Christ crucified with true love of virtue and hatred of vice and has arrived at the house of self-knowledge and entered therein, she remains with her door barred in watching and constant prayer, separated entirely from the consolations of the world. Why does she thus shut herself in? She does so from fear, knowing her own imperfections, and also from the desire which she has of arriving at pure and generous love. Okay? So right then and there, why is she, why is she separating herself and going and praying like this, she's, she's, she's after arriving at pure and generous love. Okay, we need God to be able to love. We need, we need, we need actually, we'll get, in this when, get into this when we do the, the virtues, but our ability to love is dependent on God's cha the ch is, is charity, which is actually divine love, which is in us. It's not actually our love. Our love we love God, and then that's what proportionally allows God's love to come into us. Okay? So that's what we're speaking about, arriving at pure and generous love. And because she sees and knows well that in no other way can she arrive thereat, she waits with a lively faith for my arrival. I wonder what that means, my arrival. Okay? We're going to get into this, but God's talking about a visitation. So prayer should involve a visitation from God, okay? Though, th I'm sorry, through increase of grace in her. So she waits with a lively faith for my arrival through increase of grace in her. By the way, what is grace? Grace is nothing other than God's actual presence in us. Okay, so that's what he's talking about, my arrival. So it brings about a grace, it brings about graces. Okay? How is a lively faith to be recognized? By perseverance in virtue. And by the fact that the soul never turns back for anything, whatever it be, nor arises from holy prayer for any reason except, note well, for obedience or charity's sake. In other words, if you were in a religious order and your superior says, no, you've got to stop praying right now, you need to go and do this, well then for obedience sake, you do need to stop prayer. Okay, but he's trying to say here that there's lots of things that would pull us away from prayer when we need to pray, and nothing should stop us except for something like that. Okay, uh, or charity's sake, like somebody's got to go to the hospital and they're dying, and you're like, "Sorry, I got to pray." <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm praying. Okay. For no other reason ought she to leave prayer. For during the time ordained for prayer, the devil is wont to arrive in the soul, causing much more conflict and trouble than when the soul is not occupied in prayer. This he does in order to, that holy prayer may become tedious to the soul, tempting her often with these words. This prayer avails you nothing, for you need 
attend to nothing except your vocal prayers. Okay, so first of all, do you know what that would mean, vocal prayers? Vocal prayers? Yeah, well, what's he talking about there? We know vocal, but what, 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 what's the, what does he mean by that? Well, vocal prayer, okay, so look, guys, number one. There are prayers written down that you can read. There's also, like in a religious order, there's something called the Liturgy of the Hours. Have you guys ever heard of that? The Liturgy of the Hours. I recommend it. What is it? Well, it's something that's already written out. It's like the Mass, right? And it's every day. And all priests and religious are required to do it. So I have five parts every day. If I sit down and do it all in a row, it's probably about an hour's worth of prayer. Okay? It takes me about an hour to go through it. I either read it or I have, a, I have a podcast where a guy reads it to me and I just listen. Okay? And what is it? Well, it's the Psalms. Jesus prayed the Psalms. They're pretty mysterious. They can be pretty helpful. So it's the Psalms, but they're arranged in these parts and they have little antiphons where there's a, an important line from the Psalm or that somebody wrote and it goes before it and after it. And then you do these in parts, and then it ends up being a little reading from Scripture. And then there's, we do a thing called a canticle. Anyway, so, and then there's the, like, in morning and evening prayer, there's the Our Father, there's petitions, and all this, okay? Now, that would be what you would call vocal prayer, because in a religious order, it's spoken out loud, or it's chanted, okay? So... So, but I would liken it to anything that is um, like already written down. So like, should you guys pursue prayers? Like, you ever seen that like certain saints have prayers? You know, like from this saint, this prayer, you read it. Should you pursue those? Yeah. I mean, some of the greatest, like I always remember I was impressed when I went to these evangelicals because they were all, like when I was in college, I went to their church. And I was really impressed because they were all uh, saying things extemporaneously in their prayer. And by the way, this is what it sounds like. I'm, I bet you've heard it before. Father, Father, we just, we just, um, we, we just, they always say just. I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway, uh, have you heard that before? Yeah, yeah. They always say that. We, 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 just, we, just, we just come before you today and we, we, we just, you know, we just want to have an outpouring of your love. And we just, 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 just. Okay. Anyway, but I remember... I remember I was like really impressed because I was like, dang, that's the real thing. And us Catholics, we're like robots. All we're doing is saying, a yabba, a dabba, do. You know, like just repeating all this stuff that's already been written down. But here's the thing though. Is there not like a balance there? Because if St. Thomas Aquinas wrote down a beautiful prayer and it's saying something awesome to God, don't I kind of want to, I want to feel that too. And I want to take advantage of those beautiful words. It's not like I'm saying something that I don't believe, unless I want to read it and say, oh, I don't believe that. But if I uh, hear it and it resonates with me, great. Do you see what I'm saying? So, but there's a balance because there is extemporaneous. Because like I was telling you, you need that five minutes at least every day. I think it should be at, at least a half an hour, actually. I, I try to do a half an hour of meditation. Meditation is where it's kind of like a conversation with God, and it's maybe it involves like a little bit of scripture or maybe some holy reading of some sort. So it's from a saint, from a mystic or something, and I'm reading it and then it sort of brings about thoughts and then I'm sitting here meditating. It's like a good base, it's like a good soup base, right? Like don't read about the wheel. Yeah, and then yeah. add, add, you know, add some, add some mm -hmm. more stuff to it, but use, yeah. Yeah, okay, so. I think it's food terms. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, we're running out of time, and I, I, I really want you guys to hear this stuff. Vocal prayer is just anything that's already written down, and you're, you're like, you can say it out loud, or you're not saying it out loud, but it's something that's already written down. Okay. Yeah. We did. We have a family night prayer with the kids, and I guess the vocal prayer is it's become like the wind night prayer. It's like, you know, dear God, please watch over me as I sleep, and bless my family too. And it's okay if let's come up with our own vocal prayers, right? Because it, it does bring a sense of security. I know this for my kids when we do our family prayers. And we do build off of that and like talk about things. You know, I agree with that. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, I was just trying to say that there, you, a balance is necessary of both 
Well, it's already been written down because it's beautiful because some really awesome people and saints and have come before us and they've written down some important things. And like the Liturgy of the Hours is all written down as well. And it can be very, you know, good for us. But on the other hand, some of it should just come from the heart. Okay, now let's make sure we get through this. We're barely going to get, okay, so, okay, so listen to this. I'm moving down to the no dearest daughter, how by humble, continual, and faithful prayer, the soul acquires with time and perseverance every virtue. Remember, I was talking about the, the connection of virtue, prayer, and um, penance, okay? This is key, guys. Do you want to, number one, do you want to be on a firm path to going to heaven? This is happiness, by the way. That's how I ended my homily last time. I told you, you know, getting your flask full of oil, which means you're like on a solid path to heaven. Why? Because you're growing in holiness. Okay? And you, you know, you're doing all the things you should be doing. That's happiness. It doesn't come from any other source. All right? So it's, it's not only is it making you like, you know, a really a lot more sure that you're going to go to heaven, but it it's brings about this union with God here and now. brings happiness. Okay, but this is virtue. All right? So, wherefore, she, should she persevere and never abandon prayer, either through the illusion of the devil or her own fragility? That is to say, either on account of any thought or movement coming from her own body or of the words of any creature. The devil often places himself upon the tongues of creatures, causing them to chatter nonsensically with the purpose of preventing the prayer of the soul. All of this she should pass by by means of the virtue of perseverance. So prayer has to be consistent. You've got to do it every day. Even on Sundays where you know you're going to go to church, do your five minutes at home. That's my advice, okay? Um, and make sure you do a good job. And by the way, I didn't even say this yet, and I don't have a lot of time, but I want to say this. When you go to Mass, remember what I said about the Holy Eucharist. This is the making present of the passion of Jesus Christ. He, because of that, he is let down if we turn it into a bunch of trivial, trivial thoughts in our mind during Mass. Rather, keep remem remembering Jesus during the Mass. Remember what he went through to bring you to salvation. Remember how good he's been to you. Because by the way, you were saying, I forget what you said, but I was thinking this. Um, God's wonderful answer to our prayer not, is not only to make us virtuous, but it's to even point out to us that we lack a virtue. You can't see these things because we're blind. Don't you realize that? Our pride blinds us. And we can't see where we lack, but through our prayer, God opens our eyes. That is the biggest gift he can give you. And you, you can at least see where to, where to work, where to go. Where we lack authority. Yeah, where, where you need to clean up the... Okay. So, uh, so hold on. Um, oh, how sweet and pleasant to, uh, to that soul and to me is holy prayer. Made in the house of knowledge of self and of me. You know what that means, right? Knowledge of self and of me. This is where humility comes from. It's the more he keeps opening up your eye to see what you truly are and how good he really is. Okay? Opening the eye of the intellect to the light of faith and the affections to the abundance of my charity, which was made visible to you through my visible only begotten Son, who showed it to you with his blood. Which blood inebriates the soul and clothes her with the fire of divine charity, giving her the food of the sacrament, which is placed in the tavern of the mystical body of the Holy Church. That is to say, the food of the body and blood of my Son, who holy God and holy man administered to you by the hand of my vicar, who holds the key of the blood." This food strengthens little or much according to the desire of the recipient, whether he receives sacramentally or virtually. I'm not going to go into that, and I need to skip this, but I want you to realize this. What he's saying is that at the baseline, anyone who receives the sacrament in the state of grace will see, receive sacramentally. But he says virtually, he's talking about virtue. 
So if you, if you receive with great virtue, you're going to receive way more. I've talked to you about this before. Two people come up in line at, at, at communion, one on one side, one on the other. They're both in the state of grace. Is there, could there be a difference in what they receive? Absolutely. There could be a huge difference. And he goes into that. This is, this is what prayer is leading you to. Your prayer life, if you, if you don't have a little tiny minuscule tube connecting you to the heaven, and your tube has gotten wider into a big giant pipe, fire hose, right? Then you're able, when you go and you receive communion, you're receiving virtually. You're receiving a lot. Okay, now I want you to get down to this other part that we're, geez, we're out of time. I knew, I knew this was going to happen. This, this takes a while. We have to go past time. <laughs> Thanks, Joey. Um, so, so listen. Um, I actually, actually, you owe me a few minutes anyway, because we didn't get to start. <laughs> People were still <laughs> going in and out and trying to get things done. Anyway, um, all right, so um, he says this. This is halfway down. But if you ask me whether the soul should abandon vocal prayer since it, is, since it does not seem to all that they are called to mental prayer, I should say no. The soul should advance by degrees and I know well that just as the soul is at first imperfect and afterwards perfect, so also is it with her prayer. The soul, therefore, should season the knowledge of herself with the knowledge of my goodness, and then vocal prayer will be of use to the soul who makes it and pleasing to me. And she will arrive from the vocal prayer, the vocal imperfect prayer, exercised with perseverance, at perfect mental prayer. But if she simply aims at completing her tale and for vocal abandons mental prayer, she will never arrive at it. Sometimes the soul will be so ignorant, having resolved to say so many prayers vocally, and I, visiting her mind, this is the, this is the gold right here. I, this is how you can understand prayer a lot. I, visiting her mind sometimes in one way and sometimes in another, in a flash of self-knowledge or of contrition for sin. Did you think of that? That while you're praying, pray, <laughs> praying, while you're praying, God might visit you and give you a flash of self-knowledge. Oh, what a beautiful gift. And it may be a knowledge that you're in need of, of an improvement in a certain area. What a beautiful gift he does. He does that for you in prayer. And then second of all, um, or of contrition for sin. He helps you to suddenly be sorry about something you weren't that sorry about, where you apologized to Father Matt and you said, well, if I hurt you, then I'm sorry. <laughs> or, you said, or you said the same thing to God. Do you understand me? Um, sometimes in the broadness of my charity. Okay, in other words, what is he doing? He's visiting you in the broadness of his charity. In other words, he's just sharing with you his love. Like, you wouldn't have known that love if it weren't for that moment in prayer where he visited you. And then it says, uh, and sometimes by placing before her mind in diverse ways, according to my pleasure and the desire of the soul, the presence of my truth. So there are truths that you have not swallowed yet. There are truths that you don't get. And he, and he gives it to you in your prayer. She, the soul, in order to complete her tale, will abandon my visitation that she feels uh, as it were, by conscience, rather than abandon that which she had begun. So what he's talking about, there, there were people that were in religious orders, that they, they want to be obedient, and they're going to say their prayers every day. God would use that occasion of their prayer, vocal prayer, and he would start visiting them. And they would be like, oh no, no i got to get this done. Like, they're like their mind starts going in another direction, and it's really God. And they're like, oh no, no, i got to get this done. And so they'll just continue with their vocal prayer, and they keep missing God. And he's trying to show you, no, this is how it works. So my advice to you guys is this is the gold when God visits you. So if while you're praying, whether it's, whether it's that you're, um, you're meditating on some piece of scripture or some holy writing or just telling God how you feel uh, or whatever else it is, that God will give you, he'll visit you. And you need to, you need to learn how to become aware of his visitations. Okay, those are the moments of gold. Those are the precious moments and that you want to hang on to those moments. 
So like you'll, you'll read something that sort of touches your heart when you read it. Or a thought just comes to your mind. Okay? It's a big mystery how it all works. But, you know, my, my advice to you is, you know, as we wrap this up, I just wanted to make sure you got that part about the visitations. You, I think you should read through this. Okay? But also, I want you to think too. Look. There's a number of ways to pray. Don't, don't narrow yourself down into just one little narrow way. And certainly get beyond the three-year-old prayer. You know what I'm saying? Okay? You got to get past the, you, We're not three years old anymore. Okay? But look, there's devotions. Like, can anyone name a devotion? In the Catholic Church? These are forms of prayer, and they're, it's, a, it's what we call a devotion. Why, why do we call it devotion? Because it's not actually like part of the liturgy. Liturgy, you're kind of required. Well, at least the Mass, you're required to do. But it's like a public thing for everyone. Devotion is more... A lot of devotions were formed because of private revelations, you know, through mystics. Okay? So can you name... Anybody name one? Yeah, what's one with the 10... It's like the ro rosary, but you're just like... Oh, Divine, Divine Mercy? Yeah, the Divine Mercy. Chaplet. Yeah, so there's the yeah. chaplet of the Divine Mercy. But let's just start with the rosary itself. The rosary is a devotion. You don't have to pray the rosary. No one has to pray. But let me tell you, if you're a Catholic and you haven't figured out that the rosary is the, like, it is the, it's the, it's the, how do you say it in a nice way? I mean, it is the, <laughs> the best thing. <laughs> it's the best thing. No, but see, it's so mysterious because it seems like, uh, like, like numbskull. You guys get me? In other words, blah, 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 blah. And it can be numbskull. You ever listen to people pray it, like where they're too fast? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. They're not thinking. They're not, it, it is actually a meditation. So you have to use it as a meditation, and you have to do it, pray it with faith. That's another one, okay? But uh, what are some other devotions? How about uh, um, Sacred Heart? This is where Jesus appears to Mar <laughs> Saint, uh, Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque, and then he says, do these things, which deal with like sort of responding to how his heart feels this way. Okay, it's all, it's all about the Eucharist. And all, I've gone into that. And then there's the Immaculate Heart. What, like, and so you, do, you go to first, the first nine, you go nine first Fridays, you go to Mass on those nine first Fridays, and you do the things that are asked for you. That's a, that's a way of praying, okay? Because he's actually asking for prayers of reparation. But then there's also the Immaculate Heart. Those are prayers of reparation, where you're saying, I know how you've been hurt to the Blessed Virgin Mary or to Jesus. I want to make up for that because I, I recognize that hurt. And I, want to, and I want to make up for the other people that, that are not uh, respecting you like they should. You have to do devotion to Blessed Virgin Mary. I have some of them, yeah. Yeah. Five for Saturday. Yeah. So, and it's not like you do five and then you're done. I mean, you could be, but, but at least you've, you know, okay. So, anyway, those are some rosary, you know, divine, divine mercy, all those things, okay? Scapular is, 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 you know, but you have to, part of the scapular is the promise you're going to pray the rosary. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so, like, you guys understand, there's a number of different avenues. There's a number of different avenues with prayer. And, um, but at a minimum, on the baseline, you've got to talk to God every day. But I also invite you and I implore you to put effort into this area of your life. It is the most, it's, it's like, I mean, obviously, the list of things are my, is my short list. So all of those things. But prayer is one of those main things, okay? So this is going to enrich your life, and this is going to put you on that happy state of on your path to heaven. Okay? Thank you, guys. Let's say, let's, let's say a prayer. Please stand. We're going to um, ask for the intercession of Our Lady. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you're, if, if one of the spouses, I think there's three today, didn't come, if they can watch the video, it'll be on, it's already, it's live right now, but it's on my web, my web, uh, my channel. Watch it and then just write like a couple hundred words, like, you know, half a page, just 
I know, I know what was said that day. I, I watched it. Okay? That's all you have to do. Okay, thanks a lot. God bless you guys. I'm not a meditation a few times.